Hello everyone and welcome to the first of two webinars by Scottish Drugs Forum and Waverley Care marking World AIDS Day in 2020. With speakers from Glasgow and across Europe, this piece of work is part of funding through Inspiring Scotland that aims to assist the two organisations to collaborate on positively influencing service design, delivery and national policy. I'm Leon Wiley, I'm Lead Officer at Hepatitis Scotland and a co-chair of the Scottish Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Prevention Leads. We also manage SDF's Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Program. Around the world, there have been multiple other HIV outbreaks with similar characteristics to those of the current Glasgow outbreak, where people who inject drugs are most affected. In today's webinar, we'll be hearing about international approaches tackling localised HIV outbreaks that were similar to the ongoing HIV outbreak in Glasgow. Our panellists will discuss the approaches that have been taken in Dublin, Athens and Romania to respond to and tackle localised outbreaks. There'll be an opportunity for questions and a panel discussion after their presentations. We're going to hear from three speakers today. Um, it'll be Tony Duffin, who's the CEO of the Analyphy Project, um, talking about Dublin's response. Marinella Clocker, who is the Advocacy Officer with Praxis, talking about Athens. And also Valentin Siminyov um, from the International Network of People Who Use Drugs. And he's going to be talking about how, res how Romania responded to an HIV outbreak there. We'll hear from each speaker in turn, and as I said, we'll have a question and answer session at the end. You can send us your questions if you have, have some that have been um, that have been raised through the presentations throughout the webinar, if you just send them using the questions tab. The question tabs appears on the control panel, which should be on the right side of your screen. Please note that this webinar is also being recorded. Jennifer Goff, my colleague and Waverley Cares Communications and Engagement Officer, will join us for the discussion session at the end of the presentations, where, she, where she'll ask your questions and put them, and she'll have compiled all the questions and she'll put them to the panel, to the appropriate people. So first off, could I ask Tony Duffin, um, CEO of the Analyphy Project, to join me on the screen. Tony, if you can Hi, turn everybody. on the camera. Okay, thanks Tony, and um, I'll leave you to it. Thank thanks you. Thanks very much, thanks Leon. Strange times we live in, everybody. Um, great to be here. I know you're all out there, uh, sat in my office talking to you all. But um, uh, I'm just going to talk to you now. Thank you. The slides are coming up. Um, I'm just going to talk to you all today about something that happened in 2015 uh, in Dublin. There was a HIV outbreak amongst people who were homeless and who reject drugs in Dublin City Centre. Very specific cohort of people, uh, and there was reasons why that happened, which I'll, I'll go into. Um, and I just want to uh, go to the next slide, if I may, and just talk to you about the Analytic Drug Project for a moment. Uh, we were founded in 1982. We were the first harm reduction service in Ireland. We, we were established uh, on the principles of harm reduction, and we've stuck to that ever since. We're low threshold harm reduction, so we, did, we, we have very few rules uh, around um, um, access to services and maintaining services to people. Um, so we keep engaged with people uh, and we have direct service provision in Dublin and the west of Ireland. Um, as you can imagine, uh, there's been some changes to our service delivery, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, things were very different, uh, obviously COVID wasn't with us, but just so you know, we've had to, um, we've had to close down our open access service, um, for which was you know, unfortunate, but um, we couldn't have, um, we had about 30 people at any one time, 100 people in the morning, for example. Um, you just can't do that when, when COVID is, is, is around. Um, so we've re realigned our service um, and we've, um, we were doing uh, outreach to private emergency accommodations, hospitals, et cetera. We're doing case management, needle exchange and outreach. Um, and yeah, just, just very, very busy with both work around harm reduction and around COVID. Because obviously, uh, certainly when the first wave came, we realized that COVID was the only game in town and we needed to prevent uh, as best we could COVID spreading amongst uh, our client group. We used to work with about 80% of our clients who before COVID were homeless, uh, but now I'd say entirely homeless people who work with at the moment, that's our focus. Um, so yeah, and we've had some successes in that regard. Um, up to around June, there was only one person who had passed away from a COVID-related death. And there was about 76 uh, people who had contracted uh, COVID. Um, uh, those numbers uh, are still very good in the sense that there's only two people that unfortunately have passed away 
uh, and we have around 80, 86, 87 people who, who have contracted COVID, so amongst the homeless in Dublin. Um, so yeah, um, if you're interested, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, paper called Drugs from Library Tower uh, by Shane Butler, uh, which talks about analytics work as well. So uh, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Just want to keep an eye on the time. Um, should come up now, there we go. So yeah, so uh, this is the period we're talking about. So it was August to September 2014. And, you know, and this is the crux of the matter for me. We were working, we had our drop-in centre open. People were coming into us and they were describing to us what drugs they were taking, how it was affecting them. And as you can see from the slide, people were presenting with uh, anxiety and agitated behaviour. And it was due to what was described as MDPV or methadrone and methamphetamine use. And at the time, as the small number of services was presenting with this drug use, um, about 10 people. Um, but then the, that number had steadily increased and continued to increase during those, during those weeks and months after that. Um, we listened, uh, we heard what they were saying. We didn't know what the drug was. Um, service users were reporting to us that there was a drug being sold as ice, crystal meth. Uh, people believed it to be uh, methadrone maybe. They weren't sure, but, uh, but they, weren't, uh, they weren't sure. And so people could not predict the effect of the drugs that they were taking. We didn't have, well, we, and we still don't have drug checking uh, available to, to find out as in the moment, you know, what's, what's, what's happening uh, for people. But we listened. It was definitely a stimulant. There was definitely more injecting. There was definitely more blood uh, exposure, um, and we were, and there was definitely more risk of um, poly drug use and overdose. So we, we, what did we do? Well, we worked very closely with service users and uh, we, to, to understand what was going on. Uh, we would, um, we, we, we obviously increased our needle and syringe program, and we increased the condom availability and provided specific harm, harm reduction. Um, information around this and we did that one-to-one -one and in group work um, and um, I, I just don't want to skip over that last point there people reported more frequent injecting unsafe sexual activity and unsafe and needle sharing practice so we knew there was a problem and we knew immediately there was a problem um, but then you know it's we obviously i would have raised these things within the structures within ireland um, but you know it's quite difficult when there's not not much evidence of what's going on you know the old uh, adage is one swallow doesn't make a spring as it were what is a drug trend what does it look like so we were we were the harm reduction services were responding in the moment so if we can go to the next uh, slide please so, coming up there we go there's a little delay on the slides but that's uh, because you know, naturally because of the internet such um so yes uh we there was a, it was identified in February, so now we're into February, we've gone from sort of August, September of, of, of uh, 2014, now we've gone to February, and uh, the HSE, uh, the Health Service Executive here, identified an outbreak of recently acquired HIV infections among people who inject drugs, um, uh, was, and was identified, and a multidisciplinary incident team was set up um, by the Director of Public Health. So they identified that there was an increase, uh, and they wanted to find out what was going on. So. Uh, they were concerned that the increase was linked to injecting a synthetic catenone uh, called alpha PVP, alpha, and indeed it was. Um, and as I mentioned, we 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 there was people talking about ice and selling ice and, and uh, methamphetamine, but it was actually alpha PVP, which is a stimulant. Um, and there was more frequent injecting and unsafe sexual uh, um, activity and needle sharing practices. Um, and it was, and there was a there was a sub, substance being sold, generally speaking, sold as snow globe, but we'll come back to that in a minute. The the increases were mainly seen in chaotic poly drug users, many of whom were homeless. So the evidence started to the point here is the evidence started to tell us what the experience was at a grassroots level in a home an open access harm reduction service like the Unlifty. It wasn't just us, other like services like Merchants Key Island would have had similar experiences with the client group there as well. So if we can go to the, the, the next slide, please. And so, so by October 2015, we had uh, the results of a, a, an epidemiological, sorry, excuse me, investigation and case control study, which had been undertaken by the HSE. And the investigation was the first evidence of an association between injecting snow blow and recent HIV infections in Ireland with daily snow blow in injectors being at the highest risk and I think you know 
part of my frustration always has always been the, 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 the gap between what's happening on the streets and the evidence and the research. Here we are in October. It's great to have it, but it's it's over a year later, uh, which is, by the way, quick uh, in fairness to them. Um, Snowblow was found to contain alpha PVP, as I said, and a second generation papillome and is closely related to MVP. So they, 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 we began to understand at that point what, what had been happening because the behaviors already began to change because the intervention for the harm reduction had begun to work and drug trends were already starting to change. Um, Yes, I'll go to the next slide, please. That'll be great. The, the, the link is there for the, for the actual report, just if anyone's interested. I'm sure we'll be sharing the slides. Um, so, yeah, so what did they find? The investigation found the following. So, in 2014, 2015, 38 confirmed with probable um, uh, cases of HIV were reported. Uh, and if you look at uh, the, the latest figures in 2018, um, there were 523 HIV diagnoses in Ireland. Um, in, in 2018, and, and only 3% of those were diagnoses. So 14 people in 2018 were among people who inject drugs. So you can see why they'd be concerned that in 2014 and 2015, 38 um, uh, cases have been identified amongst just this group in Dublin. Um, so, yeah, so you can see there around the, 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 the levels of uh, people who are infected female, 16 were female, 29 of the 38 being registered with homeless accommodation services. All females and 13 of the 20 males with information about were, were, were homeless. Uh, 18 of the 20 people uh, who inject drugs were with information um, available reported injecting snow blow. So they knew, they knew now that this is what was going on. Um, and yeah, the odds of recent HIV infection was, was highest in those who reported injecting snow blow daily. And I think, you know, it was just interesting to me to see that coming out and to look at it and say, look, you know, People were telling us that they were walking in the door and they uh, in, in the August and September months 2014 and describing it to us. And I think that level of information is really, really important. You know, if we if we do research and we interview people, it's accepted as um, a uh, as, as as legitimate uh, information, uh, and we need to really. Um, Accept that kind of information more more quickly uh, within the within the uh, within the systems that we have, whether it's in Ireland or anywhere else. Can we go to the next slide, please? So then, you know, we worked. So what did Analyphy do? So obviously, we had done quite a lot of work already and continue to do quite a lot of work uh, throughout. Um, Snowblow was still around, uh, and in June 2016. We did a, a campaign with HIV Ireland, um, the North Innocent Drugs Task Force, and, and others. And uh, we had quite a high profile piece done, and we got into the media with it and we talked to people about the issues. And um, yeah, it was on um, Irish AIDS Day uh, when we launched that. And that was, that was effective. Um, and yeah, it was a harm reduction campaign, which is really important, obviously. You know, it wasn't about telling people not to do things, about talking to people, about doing things safely. And um, yeah, it was it was really effective. Go on to the next slide, please. That would be great. Yeah. So as I say, in 2015 in Dublin, there were more than 500 homeless people who used drug injected sorry people who injected drugs, and a significant population at risk of HIV infection. Um, you know, now we would say that there's around a similar amount of people still, uh, even although, I mean, obviously COVID has had an impact on, on, on all sorts of behaviours, but, but up until COVID, I should say, uh, the first wave in March, we would still have had similar numbers and still had similar concerns around four to 500 people injected in the public domain in, in, in Dublin city centre. Um, obviously with COVID, we would be worried now about, you know, People being isolated, people obviously they're going to shielding units and isolation units and using drugs um, potentially on their own, and a lot of our work actually is around around overdose. Um, but of course, we're concerned about bloodborne viruses still. But anyway, sorry, back to the the ask campaign. You can see, um, you know, we you can see what was involved uh, and what we were trying to achieve there in terms of encouraging HIV positive people who inject drugs to engage in HIV care, encourage people who inject drugs to get tested for HIV. Um, obviously, we're making where was free and where to go, um, and really just trying to get people into services. So that was that was a, a, an effective uh, campaign. Um, 
And if you go to the next slide, I'll race through it. Um, I guess what I'll say to you is, is that really the point of what I want to talk to you all about Rick, was, was this notion, I've mentioned it already, but the, the idea that information comes through harm reduction services in the moment. And um, sometimes it's just something, you know, you're just hearing something that's just a, a blip. And sometimes it's a very, very, very serious and very important trend that we need to uh, react to very quickly. Um, obviously, we would like to have drug checking. Um, and there are plans in Ireland to, to introduce some model of drug, drug checking, um, probably at festivals. So it won't, if, if, unless it's available to harm reduction services in city environments, or urban environments, or any uh, urban or rural environments, indeed, um, unless that was possible, uh, we're still going to be struggling to understand what drugs are, are being used and, and what can be harm reduction messages we can, we can give. But I do think you know there's only a certain number of drugs, and for example, the stimulant was uh, was identified in the count. Sorry, I'm probably overrunning. I will I will pause it there, Liam. I see you come back into the screen. No, uh, no, no. I was just coming in because I was um no I was keep on going if you would like. No, no, um, that's it. Really. It's just that notion of of the importance of harm reduction services, the importance of the information that comes through from people who use our services and listen to people and react and do something about it. That's it. Yeah, and hopefully, and we'll see that theme running through these presentations today where frontline services and listening and that the importance of listening there and the importance of information gather, gathering and giving information is going to be, yeah. So thank you very much. And that was Tony Duffin, who was the CEO of the Analithi project in Dublin. And um, he'll be available for questions afterwards. So there's been some questions already coming in. I encourage you to keep on adding them to the question panel below and we will um, get to them. So next I'd, last, I'd ask Marianella Clocker from who's the advocacy officer with Praxis. Um, she's going to be from Athens and she'll be talking about the, the response in Greece to a localised outbreak there. So uh, Marianella. Over Hello, everybody. Thank you, Leon. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, it's all good. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so I am Marianela Cloca, as Leon said. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation in this cross countries discussion. I come from Athens, Greece, and uh, I work in Praxis since 2013. And uh, during the years of the HIV outburst among IDUs in Athens that I am going to talk to you about, I was the manager of Positive Voice, the Greek association of people living with HIV. So Greece has experienced uh, a fairly stable low-level HIV epidemic for a number of years, uh, mainly driven by men who have sex with men. Uh, next slide, please. Since the beginning of uh, 2011, uh, Greece has faced a significant outbreak of HIV among people who injected drugs in Athens. Uh, now, as we can see, data shared by AOD. So um, I was saying that data shared by AOD, the Greek uh, Center for uh, Diseases Control, agreed that during 2011, the number of HIV positive IDUs increased sharply to 260, as you can see, accounting approximately for 27% of all recorded HIV infections that year, back in 2011. Most of HIV uh, positive IDUs reported in 2011 were males and of Greek nationality. The data have also demonstrated that the HIV transmissions were limited to Athens metropolitan area. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2012, the number of new HIV cases reported among people who injected drugs exceeded for the first time the number of new HIV cases among uh, men who have sex with men. So this outbreak was driven by unsafe injecting practices among people who injected drugs. For example, sharing injected equipment, 
and kept mainly affecting Greek nationals. Although foreign nationals who injected drugs were also at risk of acquiring HIV infection, there was no evidence that immigration has been driving that HIV outbreak at that moment. Next slide, please. So this outbreak occurred at a time when Greece has been experiencing an unprecedented uh, and very severe financial crisis. It is unclear to which extent the financial crisis has contributed to the outbreak, but it is evident that the crisis had a, a significant social and health impact on the population of Greece in general and in Athens in particular. In addition, the response of public authorities and civil society to the HIV outbreak was planned and implemented, let's bear in mind, in a context of social and political uncertainty, with extremely scarce financial resources and calls to national elections almost every year. So the main substance that drove the epidemic at that moment was injected heroin. And the most popular substance at that time was smoked sisa, crystal methamphetamine, a synthetic opioid, as you know, made in Athens at that period, which was a low of low quality, but at the same time, it was very cheap. So users, despite the economic crisis, could afford it. Uh, smoked sisa has never been associated with the spread of the epidemic, but as one of the produced effects was to increase sexual desire, it was something that has been taken under consideration when we tried to scale up harm reduction interventions in the near future. So in 2010, Okana, which was the only Greek national body that provides and still is the only international body, uh, Greek sorry, body that uh, provides OST, has set the target to absorb the waiting list of people asking for OST, that was very big at that moment, and created several more OST units. So at that time, Greece counted with 74 therapeutic programs providing all kinds of treatments. 25 of them were opioid substitution, substitution units. We talk about an approximately 8,000 users, drug users, that were treated in these above mentioned 74 agencies in 2010. And approximately 70% of those 8,000 8, uh, were treated in OST programs. What is important and interesting to bear in mind is that laboratory testing for HIV was a prerequisite for admission to all drug treatment services in Greece. So in order to absorb the list of people waiting to get OS in OST programs, you had to uh, make a, a test. You had to test those people for HIV. Next slide, please. So the Greek Ministry of Health called for help. EMCDDA and ECDC and other uh, European bodies to make a rapid risk assessment at the end of 2011, where measures to break the transmission cycle were proposed, namely, of course, the provision of sterile injected equipment and intensified opioid substitution treatment. These measures would require the coordination of public authorities and civil society at the strategic and operational levels. So as it was stated in this report that you can see now in the slide, uh, it says that there was a strong need to establish AIDS coordination bodies with strong mandates and sufficient resources at strategic and operational level in order to maximize the response. These bodies need to involve a number of ministries, local authorities, police, civil society, and other key stakeholders stressing that it was a need to coordinate the response in the current HIV outbreak in Athens, but also to response to the HIV in national level. It was highly recommended at that period that access to HIV testing had to increase and HIV tests should be free of charge in all testing facilities based on the public health principles of informed consent and medical confidentiality. There are some issues that you hear and you find it uh, very logical, but you will see what happened later. Next slide, please. 
So the good news were that Okana established an outreach network with civil society organizations that already had been state working or they wanted to learn how to do state work. So previous short-term education among volunteers of the organizations led by experienced state workers of Okana and mixed strict work teams operated for more than two years in the streets of Athens. The aim was to scale up the distribution of kits for safer intravenous use, including condoms, approaching the suggested standards by WHO, ECDC, EMCDTA, etc. The second interesting thing that happened is that uh, took part monthly meetings with all relevant stakeholders, including representatives of the Ministry of Health, all national organizations working on drugs, members of the academia that they were engaged with drug use and non-communicable diseases, clinicians working on HIV hospital or units, active civil society organizations, and sometimes people from the Athens municipality were also present. The structure of those meetings were to report of different kinds of interventions in order to try to avoid overlaps, to evaluate what those interventions were bringing as a, as a result to our common goal of scaling up uh, HIV testing, um, the provision of uh, clean syringes, etc. And uh, all this took place under a very difficult environment as nobody, but nobody <laughs> from those factors was used to such kind of coordination and collaboration and many obstacles were present on the way. The third interesting uh, action implemented was the creation of Athens Checkpoint in 2011, but also having mobile units in the streets providing free and anonymous rapid tests for HIV and direct linkage with HIV clinics. Both interventions were carried out, uh, the Athens Checkpoint and the mobile units were carried out by civil society organizations as national services were underfunded due to the economic crisis, with the only exception, and very interesting exception, of a partial governmental funding to the project of Aristoteles, based also on the principles of test and leak. Aristoteles was giving economic incentives to drug users in order to come, get tested, and bring friends. Aristoteles' project was led by the ECPA University, and it was conducted from 2012 in, uh, until 2013, um, having uh, an, an amount of unique uh, drug users, about 3,300. So, the fourth interesting action implemented was to use our low threshold premises. When I say our, I mean of the civil society organizations. And in collaboration with the doctors of the HIV clinics, homeless HIV positive drug users agreed to be part of the directly observed therapy program. As they were using those facilities, to have a shower or to wash their clothes or to get their meals, generally speaking, to cover their basic needs and not HIV treatment, which was not among their basic needs. So that was a very interesting opportunity. And it was important because um, we had some problems concerning the linkage. Okay, we test them, we try to find them, we test them, we find them positive, we try to link them, but what happens next? Uh, Drug users had to make a journey to reach the HIV clinics. And HIV clinics, on the other hand, weren't used to having such patients. And the general background was not in favor of this new kind of relationship, let's say. So we also have to bear in mind that Greece, as I told you at the beginning, was under a severe economic stress, whose impact was felt primarily in the healthcare sector. Next slide, please. Another bunch of actions implemented were in early April 2012, while the outbreak was reaching an unprecedented numbers, as I told you before. In the eve of the fourth, if I remember well, national elections 
within three years, the Minister of Health, together with the Minister of Public Order, authorized an operation of arrests, HIV testing and imprisonment of women from the open drug scenes of Athens under the accusation of spreading HIV and causes grievous body harm. The narrative was that migrant women drug users, knowing that they are HIV positive, used to be sex workers transmitting the virus to their innocent male victims. The documentary, documentary Ruins uh, by Zoe Mavrudi describes very well the situation, the way that the cleaning Athens from migrants narrative didn't work, as there was no evidence that women migrants were leading the epidemic. It also describes the harm caused to those women drug users that were used as scapegoats. The positive outcome uh, was the joint, were the joint efforts of the civil society organizations that made the issue well known abroad and even provoked reactions from world bodies like the UNAIDS, Human Rights Watch, the scientific body of the AIDS conference in Melbourne, etc. All these plus domestic, domestic efforts uh, helped a lot to ban this disgusting law that backed such operations. Then another interesting action implemented uh, was uh, the factor that um, the creation of the Greek Drug Users Network that helped to spread quick the news and prevention ways by internet, mostly by internet at that period, and in some occasions among the homeless drug users on the streets. Some people of the network were incorporated in the streetwork projects of the NGO Praxis, Positive Voice, Prometheus, Steps, and their liaisons with the open drug scenes helped in spreading the news and also uh, harm reduction approaches. As an outcome of the working together experiment with national authorities, the civil society sector formed the platform of orgs on psy psychoactive substances back in 2013 aiming at monitoring laws, monitoring the press, establish frequent contact with the open drug scenes, and exchange of information on a weekly basis, assist the newly formed drug users network, and carrying out together the campaign Support on Punish, starting from 2013 till today. Next slide, please. There is a big question coming with this slide. If we are done. <laughs> and as we can see from this slide from uh, AOD, the diagram kept stable from 2014 and on, but not low. Reporting from the 2014 till today, 100 new diagnoses among IDUs annually. In 2019, 50% of the new diagnoses were late presenters. So IDUs are currently the second population at risk that drives the epidemic in Greece, which means that, of course, we are not done. Next slide, please. Concerning new diagnosis and antiretroviral treatment, in red, in this slide, you can see the percentage of starting uh, antiretroviral treatment among uh, IDUs, which is smaller uh, com comparing to MSM and to heterosexual transmission, part of which is the new hetero heterosexual transmission among migration, migrants, 20 to 25%. Next slide, please. The new Aristoteles, the second Aristoteles project, it was implemented within the period 2018-2020 in order to understand what is happening nowadays, carried out in approximately 1,600 uh, unique users, drug users. It showed that the main substance used in Athens changed in injected cocaine and spitball. The average of participants in the program was 40 years, in the majority men, Greek nationals. It was observed that in the period in, of the last two years, 2018-2020, the percentage of IDUs who were homeless, uh, it was 25% compared to 17% of 2013. So we had a raise of homeless drug users. Uninsured also raised 
to approximately 80 from 58.8 that was in 2012, and unemployed. Also, the percentage of people who report use at least once a week has increased, while there is a decrease in the percentage of people who report receiving free syringes at the last 12 months. Next slide, please. Other priorities like refugee flows, ongoing economic crisis, and the recent COVID-19 pandemic took all the attention from the epidemic the last years and months. But even after the announcement of these results from September 2020, two months ago, till today. One positive intervention that was forced to be implemented in a manner of speaking due to the COVID-19 pandemic was the establishment of the first shelter for homeless drug users in the center of Athens. If funds and governmental attention will be given to the epidemic today, I am sure that previous experience, coordination exercise, and human rights approach, uh, together with the emerge of the active role of the community, will help us find solutions. So at the end, I feel the need to thank uh, all my colleagues from the broad civil society in Greece who overcame obstacles and worked together. I want to thank my colleagues from Europe, particularly, as Leon also mentioned before we start, uh, those friends who participate in the Civil Society Forum of HIV AIDS that helped our efforts during 2012 and 13, all the way helped our efforts to reach our voices to the European bodies. And also uh, thank the European bodies themselves for their technical guidance that they have been providing. Next slide, please. And the last one. These are the references that I have been using for uh, this speech. So it's a lot of, of material that you, can, that you can use and you can see. Most of it is in English. And last slide, please. I want to thank you by sharing this wonderful picture where civil society and community work together uh, in order to tackle human rights problems and the, uh, the HIV epidemic among IDUs in Greece. Thank you. Thank you, Marinola. That was, that was great and very interesting. And it's very interesting to see the kind of the longer term issues that are there as well. Like there was the civil um, society response and everything, which seemed to work initially, but then if government, et cetera, don't do something long-term, then you can have this, the, the lower level of mm. uh, continues, you know, so it's like, um, so, okay, we will discuss more of that at the end. So thank you, Marianella Cl Clocker for that. And now we'll go to Valentin Siminov um, from the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, talking about how Romania responded to an HIV outbreak there. And, um, I, Part of me of us asking Valentin was because I was at a presentation he did in in um, Romania a number of years ago where he was talking about their response there to HIV and the power of community there. So um, if I can go over to Valentin. Um, Thank you very much, Leon, um, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, be part of this webinar. Um, I will focus my presentation mostly on the period 2011 and 2014, with a very, very short uh, brief on, on the situation today. Uh, if we can go in the presentation, in the first side, uh, slide, please. Some background information. Uh, heroin became available in Romania in the early 90s. And um, well, in, in 1999, something like that, we had an estimated 1,000 people who inject drugs and then just four years later we had the whooping 40,000 which was based on UNAIDS uh, UNA estimations where, which was not very clear but a year later we had the 24,000 um, population of people who inject drugs in Bucharest which was the basis of uh, designing uh, interventions in, in the uh, coming years uh, and today the population is stabilized around 20,000 people who inject drugs. Drug possession uh, for personal use is criminalized. 
HIV and TB treatment are available uh, free of charge for those who have medical insurance. And actually people living with HIV are prioritized the access uh, free uh, of, of charge. Opiate assisted uh, treatment is available in public and private services, but um, the number, the coverage varied between 1,000 and 1,500. It never went upper, unfortunately. So I would estimate 1,000 people uh, um, receiving uh, substitution treatment. Needle and syringe programs, actually syringe programs, we don't distribute needles, um, are funded mostly through international funds and um, with limited support from the uh, municipality of Bucharest. And it's worth saying that um, harm reduction started in Romania fairly early for the region in, in the year 2000 with a, with a drop-in center uh, and uh, the first outreach service with a van uh, on the streets uh, was initiated in 2003-2004. Police brutality and harassment against people who inject drugs is uh, quite common, unfortunately. Uh, most of harm reduction services and in particular syringe distribution services are concentrated in Bucharest and um, the harm reduction providers supporters are organized and communicate through the Romanian harm reduction network which is a very small organization that I used to coordinate in the past. Uh, next slide please. Well I'll, I'll provide a small uh, a short uh, timeline of uh, the outbreak. Um, so before 2007, 2008, uh, we used to deal mostly with people injecting heroin, but uh, starting with 2008, 2009, we, we, we noticed that um, new psychoactive substances, uh, especially synthetic stimulants like methadrone, MDPV, um, uh, are becoming popular uh, among the people accessing uh, the syringe programs. Uh, the first substances emerged on the market through online distribution in 2007-2008. Uh, they used the subversive term of um, uh, plants, uh, plants and substances destined for ethnobotanical study, and nobody understood what this is. And also they were uh, um, sold as uh, so-called bath salts or other uh, misleading um, uh, names, but everybody actually knew that they were drugs. They became widely available uh, a, a year later through the so-called dream shops, and even in smaller city, people could procure them. So uh, from Bucharest, actually, drug use expanded at national level, but unfortunately, there was no capacity to either reach people using drugs, either um, understand what the situation is, other than to just see the numbers increasing in, in emergency rooms and also reading a very panicked, like written uh, articles in the media uh, describing um, this phenomenon. Um, in 2009, we had the, the highest coverage uh, before the crisis of syringe distribution in Bucharest. Uh, we reached about 9,000 people and distributed about 1.7 million uh, syringes. And uh, in 2009, we had seven new HIV cases. Next slide, please. Well, then in just a year later, uh, we experienced the withdrawal of uh, the most important donor in, in, uh, in the country. And not only, it's, it's the biggest donor in the world, the Global Funds to, fund, to Fight HIV, Tuberculosis and Malaria, which is the biggest donor um, for harm reduction services. And um, um, the Global Fund was present in Romania uh, starting with 2004, and uh, it funded a um, series of projects until 2006, and uh, sorry, uh, until 2010 on uh, the HIV grant. But this grant came to an end in the June 2010, and immediately we, we, we saw a, a drop in, uh, in, in distribution of syringes by half. In the same time, uh, substances continued to uh, new new psychoactive substances continued to uh, expand, and the government took steps in the direction of criminalization. There was a public debate on 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 the needed policy policy measures, and that was the result. Actually, that the government just reacted through criminalizing them, and not very much investing in in education information about these substances. Uh, the numbers in the emergency rooms continue continue to rise, and we had 14 new HIV cases among people who inject drugs. 
in 2011, uh, the same trend in syringe distribution, uh, which was decreasing uh, availability. And in, in September, I remember very well the, the news, um, 62, new, uh, 62 new HIV cases among people who inject drugs. Uh, it was kind of expected um, from the outreach services, which reported having the, detected people uh, positive to, ha to HIV with rapid testing, but not confirmed in, 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 the, in the state um, uh, serve, um, like testing centers. And here we had 62 new HIV cases which were confirmed. So it's, it's first is a, it's an ELISA test, and then the second one, it's a Western blood test, um, which detects the antibodies, I think. And also it's followed by viral char, uh, charge, uh, vir viral load um, analysis. So um, we received this news and it was a bit of a shock in the way, in a way, although we expected this, but we didn't, didn't expect it to be so high. EMCDDA and ECDC confirmed the outbreaks in Romania and Greece because they were more or less happening in the same time. And by the end of the year, we had already 159 HIV cases. Next slide, please. 2012, um, the same uh, reduction in, in syringe availability, uh, 320 new HIV cases among people who inject drugs and 46% uh, percent increase in medical emergencies called by, caused by illicit uh, drug use and new psychoactive substances. To cover uh, this, this, this um, lack of availability of, of syringes, the National Anti-Drug Agency, which is the national drug coordinator in charge with, um, um, among others, with um, the, the overall coordination and data collection on, on drug services, uh, population size estimate and, and such, uh, and also service provider providing uh, substitution treatment. They uh, purchased about uh, 800,000 syringes and provided them to NGOs to distribute them you know, on the ground. The problem with the syringes was that um, because of our faulty uh, national procurement system, 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 which is focused on the cheapest possible offer, those syringes were uh, very bad quality uh, syringes produced by a Turkish manufacturer. Uh, they had uh, faulty plugs and bad, very bad quality needles. Um, I mean, they would, would, would turn into hooks uh, in, on the second use. So uh, a lot of our uh, uh, beneficiaries were um, having, I mean, they were lo long-term users. So many of them had like uh, very traumatized veins and um, they needed a special kind of needle, which was not necessarily what the Turkish syringe was providing. So it, it happened that a lot, a lot of those syringes were not actually used. Um, and um, outreach services kept on receiving bags and bags and bags of syringes, which were distributed before, but they were not even opened. They were just returned by, by, by people to get um, better quality syringes instead. Um, well, um, and this kept on happening until these syringes actually, all kinds of syringes were um, uh, exhausted. There, there was no distribution at all. Uh, the service collapsed in June. And out of desperation, because we, we uh, kept on insisting at national level and at international level about this crisis, um, everywhere we, we, we had an opportunity, uh, we organized the protest on the 1st of July, 2013, um, as part of the Support Don't Punish campaign. Uh, it was a protest organized by um, uh, the community. I mean, we invited uh, uh, people uh, accessing services that were uh, working with various, I mean, like working with very various service providers in the Romanian Harm Reduction Network and also the service providers themselves. Uh, and now I, I remember there are some photos, I think, or some uh, graphs. Can we move to the next slide, slide please? Yeah. The way we communicated uh, the situation publicly was, um, and it was based on, on the information that we received mostly from, uh, from uh, service, services and especially outreach services, was that a lot of heroin users switched on uh, synthetic stimulants and the injection rates increased from three to five to about 15 to 20 or more. 
uh, also the using cycle uh, cycle changed from uh, like on continuous use every day to binging uh, on on stimulants for two or three days in a row and then one day or two days of, of, of exhaustion collapsed uh, this increased a lot the risk of transmission because people were not able to control their use anymore and they didn't necessarily care what 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 syringe they use and with whom um, uh, so given the fact that there was uh, on the top of this a decreased availability of syringes those uh, three elements uh, synthetic stimulants, increased injection rates, and decreased availability resulted in uh, this HIV out outbreak. Next slide, please. Uh, and there you can see uh, the data showing um, this trend, what, what happened. In blue, there, there are the number of syringes. In yellow, the number of e emergency cases for NPS use, I mean, psychoactive new psychoactive substances and then with red you can see uh, the number of cases i must say that this uh, um, data is, is quite old it's, it's that dates from 2012 13 and uh now today we have a slightly different numbers in terms of number of cases higher than what you see in this graphic um yeah we'll maybe get back to, to this later on uh can we move to the next slide please so uh, these are some images from the protest organized. Um, it was the 1st of July. Um, there were several uh, several speeches and uh, three position letters uh, with demands, concrete demands were um, um, registered to the Ministry of Health, Ministry of, of Interior and Ministry of Labor. And the place where this, this protest took place has a symbolic meaning uh, in Romania because it is the place of uh, the Romanian revolution. In the background, in the, in the photo in the middle, you can see the place where the dictator actually we he fled from from uh from the city in in december 1989 next slide please we used uh an innovative um like uh per art performance to to draw media attention and it was quite successful a street artist uh with the tag the romanian state on their t-shirt was tagging um people using drugs with a syringe and HIV. Um, the message being that the fastest way, the, the fastest transmission route for HIV among people who inject drugs is to end, to stop uh, syringe distribution. And uh, because of the protest and also because of this um, performance, we managed to get a very big coverage uh, in, in, the, in the next days and um we we um, determined quite uh, quite a high rate of awareness and pressure public pressure on uh, uh concerning this crisis uh, next slide please uh also we we distributed um information about uh the crisis in in our international contacts and uh this is a photo from a meeting where um, various colleagues from the harm reduction world and drug user community send their supporting messages uh, for us and advocating for harm reduction. Next slide. The advocacy campaign that we ran between 2013-2014 focused on articles documenting the outbreak and published through various outlets uh, and quite big visibility in, in TV reporting and also uh, in radio. We basically used all our contacts that we, we had in media, uh, both in mainstream and also independent outlets. We sent petition letters and position letters to the Prime Minister, the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Labor, Ministry of the Interior. Uh, I already mentioned international NGOs. We had the UN Special Envoy for HIV AIDS in Eastern Europe and Central Asia meeting with uh, the Ministry of Health um, and the Global Fund became aware about the situation and later communicated that Romania was still eligible under a certain special rule called the NGO rule, which basically says that although a country uh, is a middle upper income country, which would prohibit the country from receiving support from the Global Fund because of their economic status, if the country uh, manages to prove that there are political barriers against uh, services that they propose, 
and the Global Fund would be able to um, um, initiate a mechanism called the NGO rule to support the civil society in that country without necessarily implicating the government, which was their regular procedure to work with the government and through the government support services. Next slide. Thank you. Um, in terms of communication, what we did was to focus on creating international pressure because we were aware that the government will not react to our uh, messages because we did this since 2004, really, always trying to, to determine uh, uh, the government or local authorities to compensate the lack of funding from uh, the international donors or to take over financially programs once donors would leave the country and we were never successful. Uh, we tried to use performance art, uh, and this was quite successful, as already mentioned. And uh, we reduced the information to the essence, like describing the formula of the epidemic, so it could be easy to understand and you know, easy to support. Uh, we used cost estimation in the documents that we provided, uh, and statistics uh, turned into visuals to make the information more uh, compelling and more accessible for those who were not necessarily directly involved uh, in this um, field and especially for decision makers and the general public. And we worked with journalists, especially prioritizing uh, young independent uh, journalists to reach the young population because uh, Romania was, um, the, the activism was not very developed in, in the early 2000s and but it steadily grew and it was driven by uh, young educated um, uh, people uh, concerned with environment, health, and human rights. Um, next slide, please. I think we're getting close to the end. What happened next was that uh, the Minister of Health provided 210,000 syringes. That was the best we could get from, from the state. But the, min the municipality of Bucharest supported the, re uh, the restart of uh, syringe distribution through um, allocating funding and the initial initial figure was 600,000 euro, but uh, in the end it was 150,000 euro. Anyway, that was uh, well appreciated because it, it allowed services to restart syringe distribution. Uh, the Global Fund initiated negotiations under the TB grant because uh, it was active in Romania for HIV and TB. So the HIV grant ended in 2010, but the TB grant, because of high TB prevalence in the country, is continuing even today. Uh, so under this grant, there was a, a special TB HIV component, which allowed um, harm reduction to survive, actually. Um, small grants and serious don donation, uh, donations from um, international donors helped the NGOs to continue provision on the top of uh, what was already mentioned uh, above. And a new TBHIV grant was initiated in 2015 under the new funding model of the Global Funds. And we actually managed to postpone this crisis. Um, I mean, the funding crisis, not necessarily the, the HIV outbreak. Uh, strange enough, uh, the numbers started dropping and we are not very sure what the explanation would be. Uh, if we move to the last slide, I think. Yeah, uh, so here you can see uh, um, in, in blue what the figures are. So uh, the, the highest, uh, the peak of the epidemic was 2013 with 319 cases. And these are the figures provided in 2020. So before we, we these num numbers kept on changing and meaning that they increased because there were late presenters which were traced back to a particular year. So um, the, the, the peak was 2013 and then in 2014, it started dropping and it dropped until about 90 to 80, around 90 cases per year in the last years. Um, but for example, if you look at the uh, upper row MSM, this uh, is it's, it's, it's steadily on the rise. Um, it may be also linked to, to stimulant use. We, we don't actually know exactly what the cause is, but uh, as you can see in these figures, uh, HIV uh, transmission is increasing in uh, key populations, um, 
And unfortunately, our data collection system does not collect information from sex workers, which are probably conglomerated under heterosexual transmission. And um, this is my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Valentin. That was great. Um, and some more interesting questions and, you know, contrasts with other areas. While there's similarities in there, there's contrasts as well where you needed to kind of um, work really hard on the advocacy um, process be before you kind of brought in the other community responses there to actually get um, organisations on your side, so to speak. So there'll be questions about that further. Can I ask all the speakers to come back on screen, please? So we're all back. The gang's all here. So, um, so welcome back, everyone. Hope you've all enjoyed your cuppa um, break and all those sorts of things. Um, and we'll just go now after those presentations and three very different presentations on very different um, outcomes and responses there. So we'll go to the questions. Uh, Jen, first one. Yeah, they were really interesting presentations. So we've got some great questions here. So we'll start off with a question that's to everyone. So I'll just direct it to each person. Um, so as the outbreaks talked about earlier, um, I'd be interested to hear about the long-term support and care for people diagnosed through the different outbreaks. How was this care managed in the different countries? What have we learned and what have the challenges been in providing that care? So maybe if we hop to Tony first, since it's been a little bit of time since you've been chatting. Well, um, well you know, care for people with HIV is, is good in Ireland. Uh, there is established services. Um, uh, both through the state and then support through through the NGOs. Um, so once people were diagnosed, they would have been streamlined and uh, and, and straight in to care. One figure that that, that was uh, given to me anecdotally, at least from a from a clinician, was that for every person that is diagnosed with HIV, uh, the cost of their care in Ireland will would be around one million euros in the, over the course of their life. So obviously. Prevention is, is, is from a cost effective, from a health perspective and from a cost effective perspective, is, uh, you know, harm reduction uh, is, is, is the thing to do, is, is, the way, is the way to go to try to prevent these things from happening. It's better for the person, it's better for the health system as well. So, yeah, no, it would have been streamlined and, and, and into care. Um, obviously, um, uh, you know, the people who we work with may have issues around quality drug use and uh, behavioural issues and such, but the services are, are, are uh, geared up for, for helping people in those situations as well. So it's quite a quick process when somebody has a new diagnosis, they're straight into the care process, there's a, not a big yeah. gap between that kind yeah. of... Yeah. Obviously, generally speaking, it can, you know, obviously people might be uh, reluctant to, to engage in care as well. Um, there can be periods where people can be in, in denial about their own diagnosis and such. So it might take time to, to, to bring them along. Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay. Marinello, is there anything you'd like to share on that question? Uh, recently, during the, the works of uh, a national uh, conference, uh, we talked about this issue and, we, and the, the, the national uh, authority, AOV, that uh, monitors uh, the linkage uh, from the moment that uh, people uh, are tested positive, uh, said that approximately it takes three months from the moment of uh, the diagnosis to the moment of the first approaching an HIV clinic. And also said that it was very difficult for them, which we don't understand exactly why, but okay, this is what it's, it's, it is said, uh, that they cannot monitor the percentage of uh, retention. So I think that these, these are areas that we can um, continue intervening and proposing ways of establishing better um, results. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Valentin, have you got anything you'd like to add to that? Well, there is, there is a well-established continuum of care Oh, sorry. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was saying there is a quite well-established continuum of care. 
um, the, the only problem is that most marginalized don't necessarily have access uh, properly. For example, there is very limited testing in, in people who inject drugs, especially in people living in the streets. And I'm not sure if there are any campaign of, of testing in the rest of the country, except for Bucharest. And I know for sure that injection is now spread in other cities, it's not just Bucharest. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of people seem not to have ID cards. And this is also a major administrative issue because it's very difficult to get uh, an ID. And uh, we're talking about vulnerable people who can't manage their way in the administration. And they need like very close company by a social worker. And unfortunately, this is not necessarily provided by the state authorities. So it also falls on the shoulders of civil society, which is quite overburdened because uh, there are not very many people willing to work in this field or not enough funding to support them. Otherwise, um, if all these current criteria are, are uh, met, then it's fairly easy for a person that is not experiencing marginalization to have access regularly, treatment, viral charge, etc. And I suppose on that point, um, we've had another quite specific practical question in, um, asking whether treatment in Romania is free of charge for HIV only if a person has medical insurance. Is that the case? Well, uh, it's free of charge for everybody. It's a priority in, in our uh, healthcare system. But for example, substitution treatment is not uh, free of charge if you don't have an insurance. And it's very often the case of uh, Romanians working abroad that are registered in Spain, for example, in substitution treatment. And when they get back into Roma in Romania, they have to get back to heroin because uh, if they don't have their medical insurance paid, then there is no access. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, just uh, to move on to a slightly different topic, um, a question is coming about whether the location of a harm reduction service impacts the level of engagement and accessibility. Um, so I wondered maybe, Tony, whether you'd have something to say about that, because I know Anna Liffey is quite centre in Dublin, isn't it? Okay, so um, a couple of things about that. Um, depends on uh, um, whether it's urban or rural. Um, so, you know, obviously in terms of uh, rural, uh, sorry, urban spaces, uh, the majority of drug use takes place in places like Dublin and Cork and, uh, and, and uh, Limerick and such. So these are urban spaces and people will, the anonymity of the city uh, generally, people the confidence to walk up and come in and uh, and, and such. Um, so that's good uh, in terms of um, in terms of the urban space. And then and then you have um, you know where where in the urban space do you put it? I mean, some people think it should be down a laneway, tucked away. Um, I don't believe that. I think they should be you know on the main streets amongst other uh, shops and services and such, and people should be treated. As citizens, and they should move and come around. They should respect the area that they that they come to, um, and and they should be given, uh, you know, their rights and and their responsibilities as well in terms of being a good neighbour. So you've got all those things. But then, just in terms of rural space, if you go outside of Dublin and into the um, uh, into the countryside or into smaller villages and towns, that kind of anonymity is lost. Um, so if you do have a harm reduction service in a small rural uh, town or village, your aunt or your uncle or friend might see you. Uh, you might not want to be known to be going to the to the drug service and then people talk and then they find. So what we find in terms of delivery of harm reduction services in the in, in the midwest of Ireland, um, which was uh, it was an urban space, Limerick compared, but also the the, the, the the rural space. Home visits are really important. Um, secondary needle exchange is really important. So these are these would be sort of secondary services, if you like, in, a, in, a, a, in an urban space. But in a rural space, these are the primary services. So giving people um, clean um, drug paraphernalia for, or, or, or sorry, not clean, clean is a bad word. Uh, you know, uh, the drug paraphernalia for their for their uh, colleagues or friends or whatever, uh, getting them in a secondary needle exchange. That's a good thing to do from a harm reduction perspective. Of course, you want to get to know those people that they're giving them to over time because that's the other part of harm reduction is not just about bloodborne viruses, it's about uh, engagement with people at a really meaningful level and, um, and creating really meaningful relationships with people. So, yeah, so I hope that sort of answers some of the questions. Yeah, so it kind of depends on the environment that it's in. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so in all of your presentations, you had lots of brilliant data included, which is really 
interesting kind of um, when we're kind of comparing for the Glasgow data, this is quite a specific question, whether I'm not sure whether you would be collecting data on it, but do you know what the rates of people with an undetectable viral load are in your respective countries? Um, so I'll maybe come to Marianella first to see if you maybe have um, data on that. No, I don't come this, with this kind of data, but uh, if you need it, uh, I, can, uh, I can dig a little bit. Is it, it's, so it's, um, that information is collected then in, in your country? Yes, it is, it is collected in cases where uh, there is, um, um, yes, it is, it is collected, yes. I can, right. I can reach that information. Yeah, I think that would be great. That would be really interesting if you can, if it's no trouble. Um, Valentin, is that kind of information collected in Romania? Well, I, I, I did not look specifically for this kind of information, but as Marinella said, um, I can inquire my, my friends um, and uh, check the official data. And probably, given that there is this 1990-1990 uh, uh, strategy of UNAIDS, I, I would expect that this data is, uh, is collected. Brilliant. My, my answer would be similar. I don't have yeah. the answer, to that, but I could. Uh, I can go and speak to my colleagues, uh, commissioners, particularly um, who work with the commission. Yeah. yeah, that would be great if it's no trouble. We don't. I think we'll be interested in that. Um, I suppose that you've mentioned the 1990 targets. We've had a question in about that. It's um, a little bit a long one, but um, I think it's maybe something you all have a view on. So the person has said there's a lot of discussion about the fourth 90 target being that 90% of people living with HIV report good quality of life. But the fact that there are localized HIV outbreaks among people who inject drugs suggests this is going to be a hard target to reach due to poverty, stigma, drug deaths, etc. What steps could be taken to help people inject drug people who inject drugs living with HIV achieve the fourth 90 target? So I can repeat a little bit of that. It's quite a long-winded one. So 90% of people um, with HIV would report a good quality of life. What do you think we need to do in order to help people who inject drugs achieve that? Um, Maybe if we... Can I, in, can I just come in for a second there? Yeah, I suppose... Yeah. Um, it's just interesting from the presentations today where we looked at um, that um, out of the three islands numbers of your prevalence numbers and your um, incidence numbers have dropped back significantly. I know that Valentin in Romania they have, but a lot less testing has been going on. So it says that it perhaps says that something you were doing there because all the, because I'm pretty sure that all the, the kind of the conditions behind the outbreaks, um, the, the, the more um, stimulant-based drugs use in that, that hasn't receded as such. So there's something that's kind of mm. something that you were doing that has impacted on that, and that may be the outreach. And when we're looking at that 90% target, that those sorts of services are very much key that we're looking at getting you know, an undetectable load, which although that's not the proof that there's not all the medical proof that it stops transmission, it should reduce transmission at least. So I don't know, what kind of outreach did you put in place there? Extra yes. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so Tony, it sounds like maybe if you okay, want to open so, um, so certainly your data is telling us that injecting is on the decline. Not massively. There is still there is still injecting happening uh, amongst a very particular cohort of people, um, but it, but that is that is something that has happened. Just injecting is on the decline. Um, I think that it's very different. It's always difficult, often difficult to get direct correlation between you know what's happened and and say well that's what exactly what what happened. Um, drug trends have changed. Uh, crack cocaine is is far more prevalent now. Uh, on our needle exchange, we would give out crack pipes and we would encourage people to, uh, in terms of heroin, we would encourage people to smoke rather than inject. Those kind of messages have had, had an impact. Um, yeah, I think, I think those, those things are, yeah, they're, they're, they're probably the things that spring to mind, the, the, the decrease in, in injecting practices, the change in, in, in drug, um, the types of drugs people are taking, and the, the messaging that has been very clearly given to people on that kind of meaningful engagement uh, at a one-to-one -one level to try and get people to change their behaviors so i think i think that that has all helped it's very difficult to to, to pinpoint 
one thing is it's just been changing over the years and quite quite dramatically, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, kind of alongside that, Marianella, you mentioned during your presentation uh, that you kind of worked on meeting people's basic needs so that they could make their way into services so that they were able to engage. I wondered maybe, it, I suppose that would maybe be part of helping people reach that 90 target. Could you tell us a little bit more about what, what you meant by meeting those basic needs? Yes, uh, exactly. That was the idea. Um, HIV infection uh, and the way to tackle it and also to tackle the epidemic, uh, it's a concern of certain people. <laughs> And we have uh, other kind of concerns, uh, more basic, more in, in basic level, concerning part of the people that they inject drugs. And most of the time they are without a job, they are on the street homeless, they have other priorities. So I think that it would be very important if we try to address these priorities uh, that the people set, not that we set. It's a little bit different sometimes. So I think that if someone has a place to live and has a minimum uh, basic income, um, he or she will attend uh, her, her health or his health later. No? So it is very important to approach um, the people that they live in precarious conditions, having this in mind and not the epidemic. Or if we have the epidemic in mind, uh, let's prioritize with the way that they prioritize their lives. Great. So it sounds like a combination of meeting people's basic needs and kind of being aware of those other factors like the trends in drug use that might change as time kind of goes on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have another question in this quite specific question. I think this would be for yourself, Valentin. Um, so it's how did people who inject drugs... Sorry, Jennifer, can I, can I add something? Can I add yeah, something? Yeah, of course, absolutely. Very yeah, it is also very difficult to treat uh, the HIV epidemic in people that they go and uh, all the time they go and out, they are always in and out from jail. Mm. So this is also something that we have to bear in mind. It is almost impossible. The criminal justice aspect of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, Valentin, if you could tell us a little bit about how did people who inject drugs get involved in the protest? Um, whether there was an existing network of people who were already involved in activism, or did campaigners support and encourage people to get involved? Well, in, in Romania, uh, traditionally, people who inject drugs were involved in uh, service delivery, uh, mainly working in, in outreach services or in drop-in services as peer educators or uh, uh, educators, but not so much in the policy making, not so much in the service design or uh, or uh, service monitoring. In the case specific case of the protests, uh, it was the people using uh, the services, mostly people in in substitution treatment who were easier to reach, not the people who were benefiting of of syringes who were not necessarily um, they not not concerned but easy to reach exactly for for organizing this protest uh that joined us uh and unfortunately there is no uh, network yet um there were multiple attempt, att attempts to organize a network but uh they they were not successful at some point there was a drug user organization uh that was hosted by the most important harm reduction provider in Romania which is Currently, currently turning into a, a sort of a, it's similar to Okana in Greece, like quite big organization. Uh, but um, you know, in, in such environments, um, there is no priority to to involve people who inject drugs. It's mostly, um, sorry to say, but sometimes it's just like just to check a criteria. Yeah, we have the users here. Here, come here. Just say your what you have to say, and then just get back to what you're doing and um unfortunately it was sometimes the case um there were multiple events where people who use drugs um participated but there was no ability or capacity to sustain this and the best way to organize i would say is, is around the substitution treatment centers but unfortunately there is no um leadership or nobody who is like willing to do this on a regular basis as it was the case in other countries there were people coming and going but um ultimately it didn't last 
And did you, how did you find asking professionals to be involved in it? Because you, you said it was a kind of a mix of people who use drugs and people who are supporting. Well, professionals were directly in, in, interested also because it was also about their jobs. That is a very concrete aspect that um, determined uh, them to participate beside the solidarity with their uh, beneficiaries. So there were multiple aspects involved, but um, I would say the most important one that was everybody was outraged of this HIV outbreak and they felt that they need to do something about this and you could feel it in the energy of the protest and then what would happen next. Oh, that's brilliant. Did I see Tony, you wanted to come in there? So I just, uh, yeah, I just want to thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so I come back on, on the, the idea of the 90% of, of what, what, what people need. Uh, and what they need is what everybody else needs. And, and if you're homeless, you need a home, not just not just somewhere to put your head down, but, but somewhere to call home. And I think that's really important. And then and then the decriminalisation of drugs for personal use is very important. I know that this is wider than the, the, the topic today, but these are things that would impact, um, we would hope that these are things that would impact on people's uh, engagement uh, around avoiding HIV in the first instance, or indeed getting treatment. Um, COVID has been very interesting in Ireland at the moment in terms of our response to the very group that I was talking about earlier, people who are homeless people, uh, and then specifically people who use drugs and inject drugs. So just to let you know, um, in the first wave in March and April, um, in Dublin City Centre, the HSE, the Health Service Executive, and uh, the, the municipal, municipality, Dublin City Council, um, led a, a, a response. People were housed in good standard accommodation. People were, uh, facilitated to get, we went from having a 12 to 13 week wait for uh, methadone maintenance to two to three days, you know, so so people were, not, were put onto methadone. We, we began to do stabilization prescriptions for benzodiazepine. We could not do that before, <clears throat> excuse me. So as a consequence, people became very stable from, from our observations. Now this needs to be researched, but from our observations, people we know, they became very stable. And I would hope that with time, as the research catches up with what's happened, that we will see one of the indicators being a decrease in HIV amongst that group, I hope, you know, but, um, but certainly things like overdose will reduce and all that sort of thing. So yeah, so giving people what they need and what, what they and what they want, not just what they need, but what they want as well, um, and, uh, and not moralising about things. I think I heard that the overdose figures had gone down in Dublin during the time that people were housed. So I think there was already been a little bit of evidence, whether it was anecdotal or not, that we've been. Yeah, some... I think the anecdotal we're, we're a bit slow on, on getting out uh, because because we've got to uh, ratify the data. But but it, anecdotally, you know, yeah, I think so. But I'd like to I'd like to see the data. Yeah, I'll see if we can dig it out. Can I just jump in for a second? Just back me up on that, Tony, there was some work from Jenny Scott down in Bristol where uh, she was looking at um, with the change in OST, opioid substitutions prescribing because of the COVID changes. So people were getting um, a lot longer doses, weren't doing supervised consumption. And the agent and part of part of the thing that they got out of that was they had they had more control over their own um, prescription, over their own treatment. and. Uh, agency basically over their own treatment and there's been definitely positive outcomes from that so you know there's a lot of things that COVID have, have shown us that we can actually respond well and to people in a in a manner which um, looks at the person's needs because that's all we can do we can't we're stuck you know we were stuck here so we so we had to respond to their needs you know without them having to come into it without them having to come into our places. So it was a, yeah. yeah. Valentin? Okay. Right. Thank, thank you, Leon, um, and uh, thank you, Tony. If I may add something from the perspective of the organization I'm working with now, the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, and what we're trying to achieve across the world uh, is to uh, advocate for take-home doses of ma ma methadone and treatment for people not to be forced, especially in this context of COVID, to come uh, at, at, at a, a treatment center on a daily basis and uh, take so many risks to, to get infected with COVID. And also uh, we're focusing around um, decarceration and the reduction of, of a use of uh, criminal sentencing for people who use drugs. And obviously uh, uh, decriminalization of possession of drugs that we promote largely 
And um, however, from this perspective, we need to also be aware of the different context we, we are operating and the, the fact that in many countries, especially in the in the in the West, now there is a, a, a positive public perception about uh, drug policy reform, while in other areas of the world, this would be a scandal, and uh, people are not really uh, in favor of uh, depenalization, de even in even the change of practice of police, um, you know, work, and not to mention decriminalization or even more bolder drug policy um, measures. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we've got two more questions. If anyone who is watching this wants to pop their question in now, get it in sooner or later. Um, no, no. Can, I, can I add something on the yeah. on the previous question? It would course, be yeah. it would be very uh, interesting if there are uh, organisations that they hear us right now. I, I encourage them to create positions within their uh, staff, paid staff, and uh, of course after uh, some period of uh, working together in the streets, like volunteers, etc. Uh, they pick up people from uh, the community, and they give them not only speech, not only not only space, but also work. It's very important. No? It's a very nice example. Mm -hmm. Paying people for their labor, definitely. Um, so we'll move on to quite a specific question. So somebody has asked. Um, when giving out needle exchange in Scotland, we ask people whether they have a responsibility for children um, in order to engage parents. As part of that process, do you engage parents when you're giving out needle exchange or um, is that not done in your respective countries? So maybe if we come to Marianella first, um, whether that data is collected? No, we haven't done that. Uh, hopefully we are going to do it now uh, that we promote all the issues in order to have free naloxone. So what what we will try to do now, after having free naloxone, is to engage uh, family. Thank you. Um, Valentin, do you have anything to add to that? Well, yeah, depending on, on, on the service, uh, whether it's outreach or uh, in the dropping centre, sometimes people have the opportunity to engage parents, but this is not necessarily in the practice of uh, services, because it's usually happening in the street and Parents are not usually there, and sometimes children just um, are hiding their youth, or they avoid talking about this uh, about this with their parents. But we have also uh, people using drugs who are accessing services, so they are the parents sometimes. So we also uh, are are I mean in Romania, people are focusing on educating um, uh, OST um, clients, for example, being responsible about take uh, take home doses and uh, harm reduction uh, measures. But uh, in general, uh, there is no systematic approach on engaging parents in, in, um, in harm reduction services. In, in... Thank you. Uh, Tony, um, what's yeah. so, so, uh, Because of COVID and everything that's happened, we're not focused on families at the moment, but we have focused on families in, in, at different times in our history. Um, we, we have run low threshold harm reduction services where children would come in. We have run services for under 18 year olds. Um, so we have focused on these things. What are, um, and you know, just in terms of the needle exchange, uh, we may come across somebody who's, who's getting a needle exchange and have a pram with them and have a child with them, and we would engage with them and talk to them. Um, and yeah, I think it's not necessarily something we record as a matter of course for our needle exchange, but it is something that we wouldn't uh, move away from. We would, we would absolutely work. And of course, you know, people who use drugs are good parents. This, there's, this, there's this sort of idea that, um, that, that because you use drugs, you're a bad parent. Um, more often than not, oh, sorry, you know, you know, people don't neglect their children, they don't abuse their children. If we come across neglect and abuse, we report this to the authorities and we work, we work with the authorities appropriately and indeed with the parent. But it does frustrate me, you know, I go to listen to someone do some training and they, they'll, they'll talk about, let's have a think about a scenario where someone's a bad parent and immediately move to the drug using parent. And it's just, it's, you know, sometimes things happen, of course they do, but we, all of us have a responsibility and we report and we, and we work with the person. But yeah, just it's a frustration I had. No, it's, de it's definitely good to clarify that. I suppose that stigmatizing view of people who use drugs that there's. Um, about them so that, that that's really helpful to have that 
Um, so we've got one more question. I think everybody who's watching is going to be really interested to hear what you say. So um, this is, with the benefit, benefit of hindsight, what is the most important thing Glasgow could learn from the past outbreaks in your countries? So maybe this time we'll start with Valentin. Well, I, I think the contexts are quite different um, in the sense that uh, I, am the, I am under the impression that you have quite good relationship with local authorities and maybe harm reduction services are not as uh, badly perceived as in my country. And they are quite, um, you know, the provision is, is quite con continuous. You don't have problems with funding. So you don't need to rely on international public or shaming of your own city, you know, to determine like the mayor or whoever is in decision to, to, to make a change. Uh, definitely there is a, sim uh, like a similarity between the, the publics, the populations uh, that are affected. In, in, in Romania, also the, the people who are most affected are people living in the streets. And uh, we see that uh, they don't nest, are not only affected by HIV, but also hepatitis C, and also uh, sometimes, unfortunately, multiple drug resistant TB. And it's very difficult to uh, um, approach this, this issue, you know, because of people not being necessarily able to take their, their medication on a daily basis. And this is how MDR becomes XDR to be harder to treat. Uh, but I think outreach uh, services are the key to, to control this uh, uh, outbreak and continuing testing and maintaining a good relationship with uh, people living in the streets and also with, sh uh, with shelters and uh, the problem of housing. Maybe you are more successful in dealing with, with uh, this issue of housing uh, in uh, Glasgow than we were in Romania because uh, Bucharest has a big uh, problem with people living in the streets. And uh, although there are some shelters, uh, and I think this uh, got more traction in the recent, most of the recent years, there's still a lot of work to be done. But I would say that, for example, a very good service that I didn't hear anywhere, uh, except for Bucharest, an innovative service, is a mobile um, 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 shower that is a car where people like people are uh, able to take a shower in their area and this car is circulating around the city providing food and providing support and also the possibility for people to take a shower which in some cases is this very very important thing and maybe these small acts of kindness and support they may also contribute in improving the quality of life and then self-confidence and self-esteem of people and some of them might actually take this as, as, as like a big chance to kind of get out of this cycle where that doesn't look like there's any hope uh, left. Thank you. That's great. Um, Marianella, do you want to come in here and tell us what you think would be your, the important thing Glasgow could learn from Athens? A difficult question. First of all, I want to tell you that we have this shower bus that Valentin was talking about. It is a very interesting uh, intervention, and Praxis did it three years ago. Um, but I think that Glasgow, uh, also Athens, not only Glasgow, um, it, it would be very interesting to try to treat uh, people who use drugs with dignity and attending their basic needs. I think this is, this is the, the lesson for all of us, at least for Athens and Greece, that uh, I am considered. Um, it is important to look at the numbers of an epidemic, of course, very, very important. It's a health issue. We work on that. Um, but promoting human rights and the basic needs of the population that we care for, I think it is important. Mm. Thank you. Um, and yourself, Tony, would you have anything we, to share? Yeah, we, we don't have the shower bus, but it's a great idea. Um, and uh, we do have um, agencies who go out with, uh, you know, uh, funded through the state uh, uh, and not funded through the state to go out and provide different types of services on a mobile basis for those very reasons you described. Uh, we, we, what would we do differently? I think, you know, we, we lobbied hard for supervised injection facilities in Ireland and we, we, with the laws changed here uh, in 20, June 2017. Um, and, you know, the thing about drug consumption rooms or supervised injection facilities or 
overdose prevention sites is it's very difficult to uh, prove causality in terms of HIV, I think. Um, but I have to believe that if you go into somewhere safe, if you are given, you know, uh, paraphernalia um, and if you are given a space to use on your own, that you are reducing the risks enormously from being down an alleyway where you're sharing is that a space with another person, sharing work with other people. So, you know, I would think that, I would say that it would, be, it would have been better if we had had, you know, uh, one, two, two supervised ingestion facilities in, in Dublin on the north and south of the city where people would. And again, my experience of working in the one in Sydney for just a couple of weeks in 2015, just before the outbreak of HIV in Ireland actually, um, was that, that the meaningful engagement, the truly meaningful engagement of talking to people about their drug use or about any part of their life, of course, just one part of their life, but, but, um, but talking to them about that uh, and getting to the, the crux of the matter quicker, gaining that trust. And yes, if you need to, someone wants to get a HIV test, getting them through to that or any other referral. So that would have been good. Um, I'm happy that Analiki did all it, all it could do as one agency. Um, I can't speak for other agencies. I do believe, I said in my presentation, that the information that you can get from a harm reduction street-based service needs to be taken very, very seriously by the authorities and acted upon. Um, obviously, you know, it would do well to uh, corroborate what you're hearing between agencies as quickly as you can. And, but then act, you know, don't wait, do something about it. Yeah, so there you go. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you all for these brilliant answers. I think we'll all have loads to think about. So I'll pass you over to Leon and I will uh, sign off. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the webinar, but um, but part, part of the key thing that I've got out of that is that whatever the area and the very various different cultures and communities we have, it's all about engagement and how we treat each other and the engagement with each other and accepting everyone as um as humans and human rights etc um and that then drives change and so it's it's um driving change by relationships but um this re webinar has been recorded um and it'll be published on the sdf and Wa waverley care youtube channels as soon as possible you can also view all of our previous webinars there. And, but once you exit the webinar today, um, you'll actually see an evaluation pop up and it'd be really great if you could, and we'd appreciate it if you'd take a minute to just answer those questions. Now, this is, um, this is the second of these two webinars will be held next Wednesday on the 2nd of December at 2 p.m. the day after World AIDS Day. And we'll focus on Glasgow's actual approach to tackling the ongoing outbreak. And you can find a link to that webinar on our social media and website. So finally, I'd like to thank you all for attending and listening, and a special thanks to today's speakers for what's been a really interesting and informative discussion. And thanks again for putting in your time, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you, thank everybody. You. Goodbye, everybody. No, 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 thank you.